Okay. Um, we are waiting uh, for the WHO Director General, Dr. Tedros, um, to join us, as well as uh, Dr. Teresa Kasaiva and Director of the Global TB Program and the Assistant Director General for um, our, our cluster here at WHO. Um, so while we wait, uh, we'd like to take the opportunity uh, to get to know all of you. Uh, a bit more, many of you are connected um, um, as participants, and of course, warm welcome to both panelists and participants here. Um, so in these minutes that we wait, we'd like to get a better, we'd like to get a better understanding of, um, of who is connected. We have around 176 uh, participants connected. Um, so we'd like to know who you are. So if you could, uh, please um, access uh, Slido. My colleague will share her screen in just a moment. So we'd like to use this platform to, yes, get to know you a bit more on World TB Day as we wait. Um, so it's very simple. You can um, use your phone and um, you know, use the camera function to very quickly scan um, scan the QR code um, and go into Slido, or you can go on uh, Slido www.slido.com and put down the passcode hashtag uh, #WTBD2022, and it will take you to a poll. So if you could do this, please. And uh, we'd like to know um, we'd like to know where you're where you're joining us from and your name. Uh, so I'm Monica Diaz from the WHO Global TV program. And so um, to give you an example, I'm very quickly going to post where I am from. So we'd appreciate your uh, quickly uh, posting where you're joining us from. Okay, so it's really good to see all of you. Uh, logging in, nice. We see shots from uh, Greece, uh, Nicoletta from uh, Romania, um, Archana from India, Alva from Indonesia. Wow, this is really a diverse group. Uh, Yang from China, we have colleagues from Canada, from Stella from Nigeria, uh, Debashish from Timor Leste. This is brilliant. Um, so we have so many of you connected. Please do post um, post who's joining. We have so far over 220 people connected and we'd really like to know where you're from. So, okay, so we're seeing there's a big group from United States, Switzerland, um, Sweden and India. It's amazing. Thank you so much um, for joining us from across the world. Okay. Thank you, everyone. We will keep the Slido poll open. Please do connect and share with us where you're from, and we'll keep a note of it. Um, I'm now pleased to hand over um, the uh, the World TB Day online talk show to the moderator, Dr. Teresa Kasaiva, director of WHO's Global Tuberculosis Program. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, dear distinguished colleagues, partners, and friends, uh, I'm Dr. Direct Teresa Kasaiva, Director of the WHO Global Tuberculosis Program, and I'm very pleased uh, to welcome you to this important online talk show to commemorate World Tuberculosis Day. Uh, we would like to start by paying tribute to the millions who have lost their lives to TB, a preventable and curable disease, and stand in solidarity with the millions of people who fall ill with uh, tuberculosis each year. We salute all the health workers, community workers, and those who are working tirelessly 
and at a great risk at the front lines of the TB and COVID-19 response. We are especially deeply concerned for the health of the people of Afghanistan, Ethiopia, Syria, Ukraine, Yemen, and many other settings in this time of escalating conflicts and crisis and stand in solidarity. Let us observe a minute of silence in their honor. Thank you very much. Dear all, we have organized this event under the World TB Day theme, Invest to End TB Save Lives, to convey the urgent need to invest resources to ramp up the fight against TB and achieve the commitments to end TB made by global leaders. This is especially critical in the context of the COVID-19 pandemic and the ongoing conflicts that has put NTB progress at risk and to ensure equitable access to prevention and care in line with the WHO's drive towards achieving universal health coverage. Dear friends, we have a rich agenda today and I'm very pleased to welcome our distinguished lineup of speakers today their powerful voices and uh, leaders for the fight to end TB uh, and include TB survivors and advocates, civil society, honorable ministers of health, heads of agencies, partners, and WHO leadership across all three levels. We plan to have a very interactive format. If you have questions, please use the Q&A function on Zoom. And uh, this talk show is being streamed on our WHO platform NTB forum. And we urge our members to also post questions there. To start this one of its kind talk show, I'm very honored to welcome Dr. Tedras Adhanom Ghebreyesus, Director General of the World Health Organization who will open the talk show with his opening address. We appreciate Dr. Tedra's commitment to the fight against TB and his unwavering support. Dr. Tedras, thank you for making time to join us and for opening this event. Thank you, thank you, Teresa. Excellencies, honorable ministers, our regional directors, distinguished guests, dear colleagues and friends. On World Tuberculosis Day, we pay tribute to the millions who lose their lives to TB and the millions who continue to struggle daily against this preventable and curable disease. We salute those health workers who give so much in their efforts to stop the spread of this disease and to save the lives of those affected by it. Tuberculosis kills more than 1.5 million people each year and affects millions more with enormous impacts on families and communities. Ending this debilitating disease remains a priority for WHO. And in recent years, we have made encouraging progress globally. More than 66 million people received access to TB services since the year 2000. This year, World Tuberculosis Day puts the spotlight on the urgent need to invest in the fight against TB to achieve the commitments made by global leaders. This is especially critical in the context of the COVID-19 pandemic coupled with conflicts across Europe, Africa, and the Middle East, which are disrupting services for TB and putting an even heavier burden on those affected. As a result of these disruptions, WHO has reported an increase in TB deaths for the first time in more than a decade. We have also lost ground in diagnosing and treating with TB. 
we need to urgently reverse these trends and end preventable deaths and suffering. Let me highlight three priorities for action. First, we call on high burden countries and the international community to urgently step up domestic and international investments in expanding access to the tools we have and in developing new tools. Global spending on TB diagnostic, treatment, and prevention services fell from $5.8 billion in 2019 to $5.3 billion US dollars last year, which is less than half of the global target of US $13 billion annually by 2022. We need to more than double investments in research and development to drive discovery of new tools, including vaccines, and to scale up life-saving innovations. To intensify vaccine development, building on lessons from the pandemic, and WHO plans to convene a high-level summit later this year. Like all investments in health, investments in TB will yield significant benefits through life-saved healthcare costs subverted and increased pro productivity. Second, we call on all countries to restore and maintain essential TB services, even in the face of COVID and other emergencies. These services can and should be delivered alongside services for COVID-19 and should also be integrated into national pandemic preparedness plans. We're especially concerned for the health of people with TB in Afghanistan, Ethiopia, Syria, Ukraine and Yemen, where conflict is jeopardizing their access to services and their very lives. Given that Ukraine has a high burden of drug-resistant TB, WHO is working closely with partners to support access to TB care services, including for refugees and displaced populations. Third, we call on all countries and partners to urgently ramp up the TB response as we reach toward the, 2000, 20, the 2022 targets. Lives depend upon it. This includes high-level political leadership and dialogue. Next year's second high-level meeting on TB provides an important opportunity to catalyze action. In the coming months, WHO will work with the offices of the Secretary General and the President of the General Assembly to prepare for the meeting. Thank you all for your continued commitment, engagement, and support as we work together to fight this ancient disease. As we mark World TB Day, I urge all countries, partners, and civil society to redouble their efforts to end TB. I thank you, and Teresa, back to you. Thank you very much, Dr. Tedros, for your inspiring words and uh, <coughs> opening this talk show. Uh, we appreciate your leadership and support. Uh, dear colleagues, we have nearly 300 uh, people joined, and uh, this uh, talk show is streamed also. And also would like to remind you uh, that uh, um, uh, please look at your screen. You can, you can um, uh, use uh, this uh, uh, technical opportunity to connect, and uh, interpretation in five UN languages is also available. Um, dear colleagues, it's my great pleasure now to introduce uh, the WHO Goodwill Ambassador for Tuberculosis and HIV, the First Lady of China, Her Excellency Professor Peng Luan, and uh, we would like to appreciate and sincerely thank Professor Luan uh, for her support and for joining today's event uh, and delivering her keynote address. Tunjing 
对于维护人类健康福祉、促进全球可持续发展具有重要的意义。近年来，在世界卫生组织积极推动和国际社会共同努力下，全球结核病防治取得了显著的成果，发病人数和死亡人数都明显下降。结核病已经退出了全球十大死因的行列。中国政府高度重视结核病防治，将这项工作纳入“健康中国”战略，设立专项经费，免费为患者提供检查、服务和治疗药品，推广新的诊断技术和新药的应用。结核病患者治愈率保持在。百分之九十以上。新冠肺炎疫情发生以来，政府和社会各界积极采取行动，关心、关爱结核病患者，确保治疗不因疫情而中断。我参与结核病防治工作十多年来，走访了不少医疗机构、学校和社区。看到千千万万名医务工作者和志愿者用爱与行动守护健康，结核病防治离不开他们的真情奉献和默默付出。我始终记得最美防老人，年过九旬的中国医生马瑜教授，他从事结核病诊疗、科研和教学工作已经。六十多年，疫情期间呢，仍然从事临床工作。他用精湛的医术和医者情怀，让无数的患者重获健康，重拾希望。他将一辈子奉献给了结核病防治事业。他常说的一句话是：“最有效的处方就是爱。”我为世界上。有像他一样的医务工作者而感动。防治结核病更需要倡导全社会的广泛参与。在中国，有一百多万名志愿者向公众普及结核病防治知识，为患者提供帮扶和支持。他们像和煦的春风，向人们传播关爱和温暖。女士们、先生们、朋友们，虽然结核病防治已经取得很多成绩，但结核病依然是严重危害公众健康的全球性公共卫生问题。受新冠肺炎疫情影响，结核病防治任务更加艰巨。面对新的挑战，我们必须有信心、有爱心、有恒心。作为世界卫生组织结核病和艾滋病防治亲善大使，我深知结核病防治对人民生命健康十分重要，我将尽心尽力为此做出努力。在此，我呼吁所有人秉持生命至上的理念，全力投入终结结核。我期待。各国分享结核病防治的经验，在世界卫生组织的领导下，开展富有成效的合作。让我们携手并肩，积极行动，推动联合国2030年可持续发展议程健康目标如期实现，共同构建人类卫生健康共同体。谢谢大家。We, we thank Her Excellency Professor Pen Luang for her great advocacy and strong leadership and uh, for the message of love, care and support. Dear colleagues, um, at the start of this week, we released new guidelines on managing TB in children and adolescents who are left behind in accessing life-saving TB prevention and care. 70-year-old Kiara joined us for the press conference and we're very pleased to have her joined this talk show to share her story 
and painful experience with drug-resistant TB as a child and how she overcame it. We also welcome her perspectives on how the new WHO guidelines could be a game changer for over a million kids and adolescents struggling with TB and drug-resistant TB each year. Welcome, Chiara, and we look forward to hearing from you. Good day, everybody. I bring you greetings from Cape Town, South Africa. Our country is one of the highest burdens of TB in the world. It is an honor and a privilege for me to be sharing my story with you today. My name is Kiara Gosselit. I was born in Cape Town on 17th April 2004, and I'm currently 15 years old. Six years ago, when I was only 11 years old, I had started experiencing pain in my lungs when breathing. My mom took me to the clinic to be tested for TB. After two weeks, I got my TB positive results. This was the start of a long journey to recovery. At this time when I was diagnosed, my twin brothers were just completing the treatment. They had MDR TB too. We suspect that we could have TB from adult family members in the home. My two uncles had MDR TB. First, they developed XDR TB. They passed away due to non-adherence of the TB medication. An aunt living close by contracted TB as well. TB disease was very prevalent, was very prevalent within our family. Uh, my first recollection that something was drastically wrong was in my mom went to my school one day to fetch me. We had just gone back inside after interval when the intercom heard the secretary calling me to come to the office. One look at my mom, in my heart. She was upset, her eyes were red and puffy and she had been crying. I had TB. I had no idea what TB was then, but I sensed it was something very bad. I saw a flashback today from taking the, medic the TB medication. Taking all tablets every day was very hard. The worst tablet of all in my experience was amoxifloxacin. It was a peachy color on the outside and a horrible green color on the inside, and it tasted very bad. I also remember while I was at Brooklyn Chess Hospital, that I was a participant on a TB trial for a black capsule. I don't know what it was called, but it affected my complexion and darkened my skin tone a lot. It also caused itchy skin. This tablet also caused severe redness if I went into the sun. Um, the children at school called me tomato, so I was very, um, I felt very bad and embarrassed. Some tablets were so big and so, and so difficult to swallow. The nurses helped me by crushing the tablets with water to make it into a liquid form. They used a syringe to administer it, but the nurse explained then that this was not ideal because it could affect the tablet. Taking tablets at home lost up to six hours of struggling to swallow all. As a result, I sometimes just had to stay up until 2 a.m. at night just to finish taking all my medication, one tablet at a time. This drained all my energy and I felt very demotivated. Taking the medication as a child was such a bad experience that I inevitably succumbed to the temptation of hiding my medication and found some creative ways of hiding my tablets. Uh, the daily injection was a very painful and scary experience. I can still remember the sensation of a TB injection entering and running through my body. It made my leg numb for a few seconds. Sadly, some children burning loss from, in, from the injection. This possibility was a fearful reality which scared me and my family. My grandmother, who was my primary caregiver, was working full time. She was forced to Brooklyn Chase Hospital for TB patients. Arriving at the hospital was a very scary experience. I was initially alone in an isolation ward. At first, I cried a lot, but then I got used to it. I was happier when I was moved to the general ward. Here were tight conditions, though, and I remember the medication taking ritual with our nurse. She let all the children gather around the table in the mornings to take our medication together. No tricks were tolerated. It was more fun to do with other children than going through it alone. The hospital also has a school on the premises, and I completed grade seven there. 
sadly I lost contact with all my friends and family. I mean, so my friends and teachers at my original school. However, I made some new friends at Brooklyn Chest Hospital. The nurses and doctors were really kind and friendly. I remember the nice fish and mashed potatoes the staff cooked for us. It was my favorite. My grandmother also visited me regularly and brought treats for me. This was a highlight that I looked forward to a lot. The lesson I learned and would like to encourage everyone with is that TB is cured and we must be champions for the proper diagnosis and treatment of TB. A huge challenge for me was dealing with stigma. It was especially lonely when my family members refused to let my cousins play with me or even come near me. Education and awareness is very important to remove the stigma associated with TB. Today, I'm grateful to be fully healed and that the TB experience is behind me. But millions of children need our help. This is why I decided to be a champion for change. I've participated in TB video documentaries, radio interviews, world TB day events, and TB conferences to share my story. As I listen and learn about the new guidelines released today, I'm amazed at the successful research which has enabled the shortening of, three of TB treatment for, from uh, six to four months for mild TB disease, and for the ongoing research to shorten treatment for more severe forms of TB. I'm impressed with the successes in reducing the number of tablets needed on a daily basis and the improvements in child-friendly populations. It is pleasing to hear about the research to improve flavor and taste to make TB treatment for our children better and easier. I'm so happy that children don't need to take painful injections anymore to get better, like I had to. It is also encouraging to learn that rapid molecular tests can return TB results, including detection of drug resistance in a few hours instead of a few weeks. I would like to call on world leaders to take action now and implement the new TB guidelines in countries as fast as possible. We also need more funding to develop new TB drugs and vaccines. Over 1 million children in the world get sick with TB every single year. I don't want them to go through the same painful experience that I went through. It is time for a change. Please invest to end TB and save lives today. Thank you. So thank you very much, uh, Chiara. We applaud all together to you. You are very brave. You are a real champion. And uh, so please stay with us. And you're sharing excellent experience and great messages. Uh, I would like now to, to give a brief introduction of the sessions and set the scene for our discussion today. We will have two sessions at this event. The first session will uh, focus on country and regional leadership and progress in showcasing efforts to close resource gaps in the TB response and fast track progress to NTB, especially in the face of COVID-19 pandemic and conflicts. Innovative approaches will be also presented, including high level leadership, multi-sectoral engagement and accountability and intensified TB research. We are very pleased uh, to have high level participation with four ministers of health and two WHO regional directors joining. The second session will be an interactive panel with heads of agencies and with our close partners. Um, this will be followed by, by an interactive Q&A session with the selected questions curated from the Zoom and NTB forum platforms. Please do type your questions in the Q&A function. Let's now start with the high-level country session. We are very honored and pleased to have uh, with us uh, Honorable Health Ministers of Cambodia, Oman, Indonesia, and Timor-Leste. We have WHO Regional Directors from the WHO Eastern Mediterranean Region and Europe. And uh, now let's move that direction. As you are aware, the COVID pandemic, and we've highlighted many times, um, uh, severely impacted the TB response in several countries, including those who are present here today. These countries have stepped up efforts to address both diseases in parallel. Uh, let's hear their experiences. And immediately with uh, great pleasure, I would like to start with Your Excellency Honorable Dr. Uh, o. Vandina, Secretary of State for Health from Cambodia. 
And there has been extensive progress made in the country towards ending TB, due to which this country has transitioned from the high TB burden country, at least uh, even despite of the COVID uh, impact. And we are very pleased to have Honorable Minister with us and invite you to take the floor and share your experience. Yeah, thank you very much. And, uh... Afternoon, good evening from Cambodia. And uh, Honorable Dr. Tedros Adhanom Gibrezus, uh, WHO Director General, uh, Dr. Teresa Kasava, Director of the WHO Global TV Program, Minister of Health Delegation, Donor Agencies, Partners, Civil Society, and TV Survival Representative, and ladies and gentlemen. Every day around the world, over 4,000 100 people die from TB, and nearly uh, 30,000 people fall ill with TB disease, despite it being preventable and treatable. The COVID-19 pandemic has reversed years of progress in fighting against TB toward achieving the target of NTB strategy and sustainable development goals by 2030. At the country and regional and global levels, we all need to redouble our effort and invest to end TB and to save life to urgently close widening gaps. In Cambodia, we have made re remarkable progress in reducing the incident rate by 22% between 2015 and 2019 and transition out of the list of 30 high TB burden countries in the middle of last year. However, we remain on the global TB watch list, meaning that we must continue to monitor and prioritize TB services. We believe that in the year 2020, up to one third of the estimated 46,000 TB patients have not yet been rich and missing. The COVID-19 pandemic caused challenges to the Cambodia TB program, resulting in a 3% reduction of TB cases detection in 2020 compared to 2019 and a 26% reduction in 2021 compared to 2020. Guided by the NTB strategy, the Western Pacific Regional Framework and the National Strategic Plan to NTB, Cambodia was committed and has accelerated efforts to reduce the COVID-19 impact and ensure that TB prevention, treatment, and care services are maintained to get back on track to reach and TB target. Of course, COVID-19 prevention and public health safety measures are applied at all facilities and during community TB screening activities to keep health care workers and community members as safe as possible while continuing TB service provision. Current TB-related intervention as standard, including hospital linkage, TB diabetes services, contact investigation, and restarting active TB care finding uh, intervention where possible. In addition to this intervention, Cambodia is introducing a number of new innovative approaches. These include, but are not limited to public-private much for TB prevention, care, and treatment, the inspection of gene expert as an initial diagnosis for all presumptive TB cases, community-led TB monitoring, all have been implemented and are currently scaling up. Under the leadership of the National Center for Anti-Tuberculosis and Leprosy Control, Ministry of Health, with support from WHO and other stakeholders, we are conducting TB research and studies to generate evidence-driven strategy. For example, TB patient pathway, the cascade of care analysis, all oral shorter regime for MDR or TB, and systematic TB screening in private and public health care settings. The way forward to eliminate TB in Cambodia. The third national TB prevalence survey and TB inventory study are under discussion. The national multi-accountability framework guidance 
for multi-sectoral engagement and accountability is in development, with particular consideration given to lesson learned and best practices from the COVID-19 whole government response platform. Together, we are united. We shall invest to NTB Safe Life to urgently accelerate our TB response toward ending TB by 2020. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you uh, very much, um, Your Excellency, for your unwavering leadership and strong focus on TB. Uh, thank you. Uh, dear colleagues, we have today not only high TB burden country representatives, and it's not surprising and it is in, in, inspiring that also low incidence countries um, uh, today with us, because TB is airborne infection, it doesn't know uh, borders and nationalities, so that's why uh, all hands should be put on deck. We are pleased to have His Excellency Honorable Health Minister Dr. Ahmed bin Mohammed Al Sa Saidi join us from Oman, uh, one of the low incidence country uh, that is pushing uh, forward to eliminate this top killer. Their focus has been on reaching all with care, including migrants and the most vulnerable through their innovative national TB elimination plan. Here is Honorable Minister's address. Your Excellencies, dear colleagues, to this very day, tuberculosis remains a global public health concern. An estimated 10 million cases were reported in 2020, despite international efforts to compact the persistent problem. Needless to say that the COVID-19 pandemic has heavily impacted healthcare and health services in general, including tuberculosis services which in turn led to deaths across many countries. This necessitates urgent resource remobilization to manage current and expected tuberculosis resurgence. We are proud that the Sultanate of Oman has maintained a low annual incidence rate according to the WHO global uh, target of less than 10 cases per 100,000 of the population. Oman halved its annual incidence rate in, the, in around 20 years. It is now seven cases per 100,000 of the population with only 360 estimated cases in the year 2020. In terms of household contact screening, Oman has reached more than 95%, including children aged less than five years, and high preventative treatment coverage as well. The majority of cases reported in Oman are the result of reactivation of latent tuberculosis required from other countries. However, all cases are receiving full treatment coverage free of charge as per our policy of universal health coverage. We are working towards reaching an elimination status by 2035. Therefore, the Sultanate of Oman adopted the global end tuberculosis strategy to develop a clear roadmap towards tuberculosis elimination. In terms of implementation, we have worked on strengthening detection through expanding and decentralizing rapid molecular diagnostic tests at government level, as well as expanding on molecular technology, such as whole genome sequencing in the central public health laboratories to speed up the detection of multi-drug resistant TB and outbreak investigations. Oman also shifted focus towards expanding management of latent tuberculosis in high-risk groups, while gradually launching screening process using interferon gamma release assay through a public-private mixed approach. In terms of research and capacity building, we are heading towards a research enabling environment to help us identify and bridge gaps using scientific and evidence based approaches. Meanwhile, intensifying research efforts through participating in national research projects, particularly areas such as molecular epidemiology and uh, geopartial projects. Man also engaging in the international research project looking at the effort at the effect of COVID-19 on tuberculosis. 
This research aims at specifically examining the effect of lockdown measures on TB control. We have also managed to optimize disease management through creating a patient-centered approach and implementing community-directed observed therapy in our communities. This has greatly su su supported us in promoting community awareness among all people living in the country and engaging with all stakeholders in this process. I would like to end by thanking you for this opportunity. We are looking forward to further collaboration to better healthcare for all everywhere. Thank you very much. We would like also to thank His uh, Excellency, uh, Honorable Minister of Health of Oman for the great, great leadership. And indeed, we uh, uh, must prove and that it's possible to end and to eliminate TB. And we have uh, uh, all the opportunities, despite the challenges, to do it. And once again, uh, big thanks for uh, this leadership. Uh, we have today with us also um, another um, the big champion, representative of one of the high TB burden countries, Indonesia, and uh, I'm pleased to share uh, the address of His Excellency Honorable Budi Gunadi Sadikin, Minister of Health, Indonesia. Indonesia is one of the pathfinding countries that has made progress in scaling up access to TB services including through engagement of other sectors and through the use of innovations. The leadership uh, of President uh, Yoko Yidodo of Indonesia has been key with his agenda to accelerate the elimination of tuberculosis and COVID-19 in conjunction. Here is the Honorable Minister's address. Dr. Tedros. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, each year we lose around 1.5 million lives due to this leading infectious disease killer and observe that at least 10 million people are infected globally. As the COVID-19 caused decreased case detection, delayed treatment, and increased mortality rates, it risks derailing all of our efforts and might take us back to where we were 20 years ago making our effort to meet the unsustainable development goals target, calling for a 90% reduction in tuberculosis death by 2030 off track. This is unacceptable. As much as we need to keep our focus to outserve TB patients and families, we need to transfer the technology to developing nations, especially in diagnostic and therapeutics, by investing more in research and development. Ladies and gentlemen, combating TB requires innovative actions and collaborative effort. We at Indonesia Ministry of Health is working collaboratively with different ministries and multi-stakeholders at different health system levels to plan strategic actions and resources allocations. Exercising our maximum effort into the fight against TB for its own part Indonesia is committed to first optimizing the COVID-19 investment to strengthen testing, tracing, and treatment in COVID-19 to tuberculosis. Testing, tracing, and treatment at the community levels are keys to minimizing transmission and saving resources. Second, optimizing digitalization of case detections. As we have been obtaining real-time data for COVID-19, we will apply this strategy for TB. Real-time and comprehensive data will allow us to find effective solutions more swiftly. Third, improving diagnosis by applying digital health technology and bidirectional testing with diabetes cases. Implementing massive artificial intelligence equipped X-ray screening to provide faster TB case detections. To expand the screening coverage, we are conducting bidirectional testing for people with diabetes to provide the earliest treatment. And fourth, improving TB surveillance through genomic sequencing. As we have improved our genomic surveillance capacity for COVID-19, 
we will apply genome sequencing to detect possible drug resistance. And fifth, accelerating the provisions of TB prevention treatment as part of prevention measures, we will provide TB prevention treatment to at least 3.6 million high-risk individuals by 2024. Ladies and gentlemen, tuberculosis is everybody's business and an equitable health system is a key to a country's health resilience in the pandemic. Investing in TB is a smart investment to prepare countries dealing with unprecedented emergencies and future pandemics. Today, as we commemorate World Tuberculosis Day 2022, let us invest our time, energy, and passion more than ever before in TB control effort. Let us put back the TB elimination progress that has been hindered by COVID-19 on track. Let us renew our commitment to fighting against the world's oldest pandemic and serving TB patients and their families. Thank you very much. We thank Honorable uh, Minister uh, for investing indeed his time, energy in, and passion in the fight against tuberculosis and looking forward uh, to uh, the G20 uh, um, uh, event uh, with the spe special side event on TB, which will be hosted by the government of Indonesia. And we are working closely on the preparations. So thank you very much. Uh, we are pleased also to have today with us Her Excellency Honorable Minister of Health, uh, Dr. Odette Maria Freitas Bello, uh, join us from Timor Leste. The country is not in the global list of high TB burden countries, but is one of the priority countries in the region. We commend the leadership of the Honorable Prime Minister and the Ministry of Health in signing the pledge that envisions comprehensive support and action to end TB in Timor-Leste. The Prime Minister also launched the National Plan for Accelerated Actions for Ending TB by 2025, uh, which is vital to drive action in the country. Here is Honorable Minister's address. Timor-Leste has a desafio para o se pandemia COVID-19 revelou a mudança em recursos humanos, financial, no modo de recursos e infraestrutura cira, o se programa de saúde minha a poder responder a urgência e a causa do se pandemia COVID-19. Notificação para o caso de moros tuberculose minha, tudo para o porcento do anulo, todo o anulo recém-lima. No atividade de saúde, para ir à comunidade cira a nível específico, Relata caso moros tuberculose aumenta, não mostra tratamento preventivo, deve afetar o você moras nem. Impacto, né? Reflete ou não a estimação do caso com moros tuberculose e retina, rio rua rua nulo de semida, deve relata caso atos lima, qual o você população rio atos ida, sai nessa caso da rua, deve bot rio e a região sudeste asiática. Itina Rihurua Sanuluresencia, cobertura para tratamento de moros tuberculose, atinge o na porcento nem nulo recintolo. Infelizmente, Itina Rihurua Ruanulo, tu um vale para porcento rat nulo recintolo. Precisa ter prestado ia investimento no ação nível urgente, no ambicioso, o de Berelori vale de Morleste, a tu atinge alvo nível determina o na, liu liu e a contexto a pandemia COVID-19 pode acelerar o progresso para a tumora de tuberculose. O tema loro mundial para a tuberculose é o que tinha o Rio Rua, o Rua Nulo Recém Rua, mas investe a tua para a tumora de tuberculose. Salva a Mouris, não irá nem apropriar o Tebes para ir ter em situação. No da Ministra da Saúde, há orgulho o Tebes para ir a rei esforço e mobiliza o nosso programa nacional de tuberculose de você passeio se ir a outro, nem envolvimento ativo, ou de boca do caso tuberculose ativo, tomamos ralo rastreio para morar tuberculose e uma carência. A contente, 
para ir a reta para apoio e fundos adicional do Sea Global Fund, Covid-19 Response Mechanism, para Timor-Leste, o montante Ossan, Tocon Hat, Rihun, Atos Hito, Sanulur e Senrua, Atos Rua, Lua Nulur e Senhat, dólares americanos, ato reduz impacto com o Simoras Covid-19 Nian, para a tuberculose, HIV e Sida, no Mos Malária. A RUS implementação aplicação telemóvel prevenção de tuberculose e a território toma não mostra o sistema dashboard nebe baseia o sistema de informação geográfica carreta móvel para diagnóstico de morte de tuberculose não máquina de raio-x portável não fatem para o morro de tibinian a nessa investimento nebe estratégico de atebes nebe horas de entrão a lá o reino. A avaliação da vulnerabilidade de moras de tuberculose em Israel Lara ralou de ONA com o Programa Nacional de Tuberculose com assistência técnica com o OMS onde identifica a população de Sira e de risco de morte a torreta de moras de tuberculose e o uso de aplicação de telemóvel para prevenção de moras de tuberculose em Israel e inovativo no da Hulu e a Timor-Leste. Di husi inisiatif dahulu, pada para moras tuberkulose, Menteri Saudi realiza ona seremonia sinatura bakuadu kompromiso, nebehetan apoyo tekniku OMS Timor Leste, no asina husi Su Excelencia Primer Ministro Timor Leste, Tau Matarua. Kuadu kompromiso refere kobri hoto apoyo no asan komprehensivu pada para tuberkulose Timor Leste, idane nuda prestasaun nebe bon etina Rio Rua Rua Nulura Sinida. O primeiro-ministro mostra lança o plano nacional da ação acelerado a tua para tuberculose e a tina Rio Rua Rua Nulura Sinima e a evento na Bejanessa. O compromisso político na Beforte apoia o Rússia do Adoro de Sida do Global Fund JICA, OICA, OMS, no da parceiro técnico, colaboração entre parceiro e implementador de Sida no a força de Rússia e empoderamento da comunidade sirenia, onde a para tuberculose, a fiar capa, e a necessidade realiza e a itinerária em dobre em Timor-Leste. Obrigada, Bárbara. Nós agradecemos a sua excelência, a senhora ministra, por compartilhar um grande trabalho a great example of uh, collaboration, uh, prioritization of tuberculosis, and rapid uptake of uh, uh, innovations and tools. We have much better opportunities despite of all the challenges than we had three, five years ago, and the rapid uptake of uh, innovative tools for diagnostics and treatment is absolutely critical to, to improve treatment outcomes, to quality of care, and in, genera in general to uh, end and eliminate TB. Now, um, I would like with great pleasure uh, to give floor to our um, honorable uh, colleagues and leaders from the regional offices. We are all together today uh, to commemorate World TB Day and beyond. We are working hand in hand, all three levels of the organization, and only uh, by these joint efforts we can, we can uh, do our best and provide all required support to the uh, countries and regions. I am pleased to invite Dr. Ahmed El Mandhari, WHO Regional Director for the Eastern Mediterranean, uh, to showcase regional efforts um, to close resource gaps in the TB response and fast track progress to NTB, especially in the face, as we thought, of ongoing conflicts and COVID pandemic. Dr. Ahmed El Mandhari, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Teresa, for your kind. Uh words and introduction. And it is my great pleasure and honor to be with you today in this very important day, sharing ideas, thoughts, wisdom, and as well as sharing hopes to save lives by this important program in WHO supported by many agencies, either UN or non-UN agencies, and as well as supported by the wisdom and the commitment of their excellencies, the ministers of health around the globe. So thank you very much, Teresa, for that. Uh, Your Excellencies, Ministers of Health, dear distinguished colleagues, my dear brother, Dr. Tedros. It is my pleasure and honor to join you this important event to mark the World Tuberculosis, Tuberculosis Day 2022. 
investing to tackle TB is particularly relevant now as COVID-19 has put TB progress at risk, as have been mentioned by many of the speakers. In the world, in the WHO Eastern Mediterranean region, TB continues to be among the top infectious disease, disease killers. For the first time in over a decade, deaths increased from 77,700 in 2019 to 83,000 in 2020. This is too many by far when we know that TB is preventable, treatable, and curable. Our, our region has its challenges. More than half of our countries and territories are affected by conflicts and other emergencies, or all fall short of mobilizing sufficient financial TB resources. However, our support to all countries in the region remains strong. WHO has partnered with the Global Fund to fight AIDS, TB, and malaria, and the International Organization for Migration to support Iraq, Jordan, Lebanon, Palestine, the Syrian Arab Republic, Republic and Yemen in their efforts to end TB, with a focus on the most vulnerable groups, such as refugees and migrants. We encourage all countries to place their patients at the center of services and ensure continuity. For instance, the use of digital technologies can help with communication, counseling of, and care, increasing outreach and helping patients to complete their treatment. Through our joint efforts and thanks to the dedication of national TB programs and partners, our region, our region countries, our region continues to achieve the higher treatment success rates globally. 91% for drug sensitive forms of TB and 68% for drug resistant forms. We are providing specific technical advice to the 11 countries in the region that are approaching TB elimination. The gap between estimates, estimated and detected cases has widened recently with a fall in notification of 15% between 2019 and 2020. So they need to get back on track. Finally, WHO is moving forward with the TB multi-sectoral accountability framework to address all determinants of TB in the region. By involving other sectors, such as education, we contribute to reducing stigma and discrimination and increase awareness so that people seek the care they need. In Pakistan, for example, multi-sectoral efforts have identified more TB patients. But while we are doing a lot to tackle TB in the Eastern Mediterranean region, we are not satisfied. We want to accelerate the pace. We need to continue, we need to invest in intensified collaboration or collab collaborative action across sectors and in TB research. This can only happen if we maintain high levels of political commitment and raise more domestic funds to end TB in synergy with the response to COVID-19. Only then we will achieve our regional vision of Hill for All by All and reach the TB Sustainable Development Goals target and the milestones, goals, and targets of the NTB strategy and the political declaration of the 2018 UN high level meeting. We must invest more to save lives and end TB. Thank you very much, Teresa, again for inviting me. I'm really pleased and very honored. And I assure you of our full commitment here in EMRO, either the regional office, country offices, as well as the member states, as have been mentioned by His Excellency, the Minister of Health, uh, Oman. And, and the same language is coming from all ministers of health and their teams in every country here in the region. Thank you very much, Teresa. Back to you. Thank you very much, Dr. Ahmed Al-Mandari, uh, for your, uh, and to your team, to, for your tireless, really outstanding work, and uh, frequently in very challenging, uh, extreme situations in the countries, and uh, still TB is prioritized. It's not, it's not neglected, and uh, you are, furthermore, you are, uh, 
pathfinding in the pushing uh, agenda of the multi-sectoral engagement and uh, accountability, which is absolutely critical without addressing social determinants and key drivers of the TB epidemic, only with the focus on diagnosis and treatment itself, it's not possible to end and uh, especially eliminate TB. Thank you uh, very much once again. Uh, dear colleagues, our uh, our talk show discussion shows that definitely every country, every leader, uh, uh, and every person and community can play very important a role uh, once we agreed and committed uh, to end TB by 2030. Uh, regions are different, countries are different, and. Uh, uh, Today, we have also a high-level representative, WHO leader from uh, the uh, European region. Uh, it is not uh, the highest uh, region with the highest TB burden, but in the same time, uh, we have nine countries with a high drug-resistant TB burden in that region. And nowadays, uh, uh, the, uh, a lot of attention, unfortunately, to that region, especially in the face of the current conflict in Ukraine and its impact uh, on, first of all, people uh, in Ukraine and on neighboring countries. And uh, we would like to hear from Dr. Hans uh, Kluge, Regional Director from WHO Regional Office for Europe, uh, his address and uh, his statement about uh, the current situation and uh, plans. Distinguished guests, colleagues and friends, on this day, 140 years ago, 24 March 1882, Dr. Robert Koch astounded the scientific community by announcing the discovery of what causes tuberculosis, the TB bacillus. Fast forward to today and thanks to scientific advances, TB can now be prevented diagnosed and cured. And yet it remains one of the world's deadliest infectious killers. Tragically, 20,000 people still die from the disease each year in the WHO European region. A quarter of MDR-TB and almost half of pre-extensively drug-resistant tuberculosis cases globally are from Europe and Central Asia. The proportions of MDR-TB cases detected among new and previously treated TB cases continue to exceed the global average by a significant margin. And the TB-HIV co-infection rate remains high at 12%. But Europe and Central Asia have been making notable progress. Prior to the COVID-19 pandemic, TB incidents as well as mortality rates were declining faster in this region than anywhere else in the world. Now, COVID-related service disruptions have changed this trajectory. And between 2019 and 2020, deaths from TB plateaued for the first time in two decades. MDR-TB and TBHIV as well as late diagnosis, are persistent challenges, particularly in the eastern part of the region. The war in Ukraine will be an even greater setback in our fight to end TB. The Russian Federation has the highest TB and MDR-TB burden in the region, in absolute terms, and Ukraine the second largest. As many millions of people leave Ukraine to seek safety and millions more are internally displaced, their access to TB diagnosis, treatment and care may be interrupted. Some health facilities within the country that had provided these life-saving services are under attack. Standard NDR-TB treatment regimens in Ukraine are currently not available in all neighboring countries. We need to take collective, decisive action. 
Refugees do not represent a health risk to local populations. Refugees and migrants should have full and unfettered access to health and humanitarian services. Countries receiving refugees should focus on ensuring adequate health services are provided and make sure that medicines used for treatment in Ukraine are available for refugees in Europe. The theme of World TB Day 2022 is Invest to NTB Save Lives. I call for investment to NTB to be quadrupled in the next eight years, to boost the uptake of the latest innovations, introduce new approaches to treatment and care, and support research and development, including for the new TB vaccines, as well as provide robust support systems for people affected by TB. To re-energize commitment to the TB agenda, the WHO Regional Office for Europe and Central Asia is developing a draft TB action plan for 2023-2030, with focus on the recovery from COVID-19, the consequences of the Ukraine humanitarian crisis and accelerators to address the unfinished agenda. In line with the European Program of Work 2020-2025, United Action for Better Health, strong partnerships are strengthened to efforts to reach everyone living with TB with the care they need. Thank you for the opportunity to speak to you on this World TB Day and I wish everyone strong health and above all, peace. We thank um, Dr. Hans Kluge, our regional director for Europe, uh, for really very important information and uh, true leadership. Uh, he is a true TB champion who dedicated um, many years of his uh, professional career uh, for the fight against TB. And uh, now, uh, in this very difficult situation, of course, trying to address uh, uh, the, all the regional office, country office, together with uh, uh, other colleagues and partners working hand in hand to address all the uh, emergency and essential needs of people in Ukraine and uh, neighboring countries. And uh, um, uh, I would like especially to thank for very important messages about refugees, that refugees definitely are, are among the most vulnerable, but they're not representing a risk to the pop population of the countries where they're moving, migrating. So, And we should do all our best uh, to address their needs and uh, uh, to end suffering and death of people. Indeed, health for all and uh, uh, peace for health. Thank you once again, um, uh, Dr. Hans Kluge. Dear colleagues, now we are moving to our uh, second interactive session. And uh, this session, I, I believe, I am sure, will be also very important with important messages and exchange. I would like to encourage you to use more actively Q&A function and put your questions. We will have at this uh, panel uh, our closest key stakeholders, uh, um, USAID, Stop TB Partnership, uh, UNITAID, Global Fund, uh, along with the WHO Civil Society Task Force uh, representative. So focus uh, of all the speakers uh, in this panel will be on key priorities, solutions and opportunities to ramp up investments in the TB response and uh, research to um, get back on track. Uh, let me start with um, Mr. Peter Sands, Executive Director uh, of the Global Fund. And uh, we know that uh, you're very busy. Thank you for joining us uh, and uh, for your continuing leadership and advocacy uh, now for uh, TB, uh, for the patients with the TB. We know very well and appreciate uh, that the Global Fund is the top international donor financing TB efforts uh, uh, globally, especially in low and middle income countries. Uh, however, uh, 
gaps remain and significant gaps and uh, the international support uh, covers uh, around 10 percent of annual needs and now uh, in the current situation these needs uh, are increasing could you please share uh, first of all uh, how a global fund um, resources and we know that this is uh, the fact uh, driving impact in the tb response and what uh, would you propose as a real solutions to substantially increase financing for TB? Thank you, Teresa. Honorable ministers, colleagues, partners, friends in the fight against TB. We are at a crunch point in the fight against TB. After many years of progress, not as fast as we would have liked, but still progress, we have stalled knocked off course by COVID-19, by conflict around the world, by the persistence of the barriers that prevent those most at need accessing the services to fight this preventable and curable disease, which no one should be dying of. 20 years ago, the Global Fund was created to fight what were then the three deadliest infectious diseases, three pandemics, HIV, TB and malaria. And since then, over the last two decades, the Global Fund has helped save the lives of 44 million people. And specifically for TB, the Global Fund has invested around $8 billion in programs to prevent and treat TB. The Global Fund is a partnership. We work with WHO, with Stop TB, with Unitaid, with communities, with governments around the world to help find the people who have TB, to put them on treatment and support them through that treatment, to tackle the all too persistent barriers that prevent key populations, those most vulnerable and marginalized from accessing treatment, and to accelerate the deployment of new and innovative ways of testing and treating this disease. We use country allocations, our catalytic matching funds and strategic initiatives. And we have focused particular resourcing on multi-drug resistant TB. The Global Fund is the largest provider of financing for drug resistant TB treatment in low and middle income countries. Over the last six years, we have more than tripled our investment in treatments on multi-drug resistant TB. In addition to our core TB funding, over the last couple of years, we have been supporting countries responding to the COVID-19 pandemic using our COVID-19 response mechanism, C19RM. And we have deployed over $4.2 billion through that mechanism. Within that total, 123 million has been specifically to support countries to adapt their TB programs to the COVID-19 environment. But that understates the benefit of C19RM for TB programs, because a significant proportion of the other interventions, such as investments in infection protection and control, or reinforcing components of health systems, have helped support or rather mitigate the devastating impact of COVID-19 on TB. But while we are by far the largest provider of external support to countries for TB, the Global Fund represents something like 77% of all external financing for TB. We recognize that ultimately it is countries and communities themselves that are going to defeat this disease. And I applaud the determination, the energy that I've been hearing during the course of this meeting from governments, communities, other stakeholders, in terms of how we tackle and beat this disease. We use our resourcing to encourage and incentivize country investment in the fight against TB. We have co-financing obligations, and the record is that something like 90% of those are fulfilled. 
And we are also working with partners such as the multilateral development banks, including the World Bank, on co-financing blended finance deals to unlock more resources to enable countries to step up the fight against TB. For example, we're currently working um, with partners on blended finance transactions in both Pakistan and Indonesia. I opened by saying we're at a crunch point. We've suffered some pretty devastating setbacks over the last couple of years, and we're facing new challenges due to conflict in Ukraine. And just in passing, I would say the Global Fund has already released um, extra funds um, for Ukraine for the procurement of TB drugs, antiretrovirals, and so on, reflecting the reality of the situation, the massive displacement of people, both internally within the country and refugees elsewhere. And we are working very closely with our partners on the ground and partners such as WHO to include, to ensure as much as we can continuity of service in this very, very difficult situation. If we are to reverse the setbacks from COVID-19, and if we are to get back on track towards delivering the ambition of ending TB as a public health threat by 2030, and thus making a huge step forward in freeing some of the poorest, most marginalized communities of, of the world from disease and ensuring health and well being for all. We need the kind of energy, leadership, determination that I have heard from other speakers earlier in this call. But we also need money. Current resourcing is not going to be enough. And one clear thing that will determine how successful we are over the next few years in the fight against TB is whether or not we are successful with the Global Fund's seventh replenishment. The Global Fund replenishes its resources on a three-year cycle. In 2019, at a replenishment conference hosted by President Macron in Lyon, we increased our resources by 15% to $14 billion. This year, the seventh replenishment will be hosted by President Biden in the United States in the autumn. And our target for this replenishment is $18 billion, a 29% increase on what we raised in 2019. And the reason for this significant increase is simply that we have either gone backwards or stalled across all three diseases for the last two years. And if we are serious about achieving the 2030 targets, we have to invest more to get back on track. And that is more true of TB than it is of the other two diseases. So we need a very successful seventh replenishment and we need the voices of those in the TB community to make that happen. So I really call on all of you in your respective roles as development partners, as implementer governments, as community and civil society advocates, as technical partners to explain the logic around why we must act now and why we need more resources. If we succeed in raising $18 billion, Global Fund resources for TB will increase by more than 35%, given both the underlying increase in total resources and the impact in the changes in the global disease split. This will be the single biggest new injection of resources we've seen in the fight against TB for a very long time, if ever. So there's a huge prize and it's a prize we need. So all of us must make sure we deliver A, on our commitments to people on the ground through the services, the courage, the professionalism, of health workers at the front line, and B, 
to enable them to do their work, we need to secure resources, extra resources, through a successful seventh replenishment. Thank you, and I'll hand back to you, Theresa. Thank you very much, uh, Peter, for your uh, strong voice, uh, uh, for your investments and for your support of uh, the idea call for increase uh, of these investments. I'm wondering now, probably you had also some TB background as uh, Hans, uh, Hans Kluge, our original director, because uh, you are really very strong and passionate advocate for TB. And uh, we are looking also forward to the successful replenishment of the Global Fund to more resources uh, uh, raised and invested in TB. It's absolutely critical and vital. And I would like uh, to refer you to the uh, latest publication in Lancet, which clearly shows that uh, uh, this uh, required 13, at least 13 billion annually for TB response uh, can help us and avoid 13 trillion uh, US dollars of losses. So the benefit is obvious, clear, the impact uh, uh, is clear, but the, of course the most important impact will be lives in lives saved. So thank you, thank you very much, Peter. And now with pleasure, I would like to move and welcome our uh, next speaker, uh, Mr. Paul Mahana, Director of the Office of the Infectious Diseases, uh, U.S. Agency for International Development. Yes, we have uh, uh, a lot of challenges, but oh, we uh, should present also our achievements, should be proud of, of them. And uh, we know that USAID is the largest bilateral TB donor, uh, has been uh, pivotal in accelerating global progress in the fight against TB. And I would uh, request to share uh, uh, the gains achieved through USAID support at global and national levels. And uh, what do you see as the key priorities to ramp up investments in the TB response and to get back on track? Yeah, thank you so much, Teresa. I appreciate it. And uh, I appreciate uh, the organization of putting this together today. It is such an honor to be among so many esteemed partners today on World TB Day as we work together to end TB globally. As the leading US government agency and the largest bilateral donor leading the international TB response, the US Agency for International Development works with agencies and partners around the world on the shared goal of reaching every person with TB, curing those in need of treatment, preventing the spread of new infections, and stopping the progression to active disease. While COVID's impact on the global TB response is front of mind, I am proud to recognize the strong gains that have been made in combating TB. Working with our partners, USAID has saved more than 66 million lives globally since 2000. Our efforts have contributed to marked progress with the declines in global TB incidents and mortality and marked increases in TB notifications prior to the onset of the COVID-19 pandemic. But we are all devastatingly aware of the social, economic, and biomedical consequences COVID-19 has had on the global TB response as the pandemic's ripples effects continue to further dim the prospect of meeting the United Nations TB targets. At the onset of the pandemic, under-resourced TB personnel and services throughout the globe were repurposed and deployed in response to COVID-19. Precisely because much of their skills and experience in active case detection, contact tracing, and airborne infection control were needed for the unprecedented pandemic. As part of this, USAID's TB platforms were systematically used to combat COVID-19, from laboratory diagnostic, diagno, diagnostic tools to community primary and tertiary care. Our investments have and continue to cure people and save lives. However, lever leveraging these platforms to respond to COVID also came at a cost to TB, which, as we all know, has lost years of progress and seen an increase in deaths for the first time in a decade. To mitigate this, in 2021, USAID supported urgent TB recovery efforts focused on increasing access to and improving the quality of TB services in countries that experienced the greatest case notification declines which are mainly in Asia. 
working alongside national TV programs, the Global Fund, and other partners, these recovery plans have focused resources and efforts on finding TB cases with program adaptations, including the expansion of community screenings using di digital x-ray and access to gene expert, simultaneous testing for TB and COVID, scaling up contact investigations for both diseases and increasing support to local on the ground partners. We have seen some successes with these approaches with preliminary 2021 data, uh, indicating that countries are reporting TB case notification increases. For example, in Bangladesh, where there was a 21% decline in reported TB cases in 2020, USAID swiftly pivoted its TB programming to help identify and treat more people with TB with interventions including simultaneous TB and COVID testing screening for TB within large industries and public and private health facilities, addressing health worker staff shortages and extending laboratory hours. As a result of these efforts, preliminary data show that the country will report a 33% increase in case notifications in 2021, as it compared to 2020. We believe that's a phenomenal uh, benchmark. Another example is in South Africa, which reported a 38% case notification decline in 2020. South Africa is currently implementing a recovery plan focused on expanding TB and COVID-19 screening and testing through an integrated service package that includes HIV testing and linkages to treatment. USAID, USAID is supporting scaling up community screening and testing using digital x-rays. These recovery efforts have contributed to a sustained increase in TB case notification based on data from USAID supported sites. Another example is in Indonesia, which experienced a 32% decline in case notifications in 2020. USAID is implementing recovery efforts that include a national plan for active case finding using portable X-ray, strengthening TB management in 180 hospitals to include simultaneous screening for TB and COVID, improving gene expert use in 93 priority districts, and conducting TB and COVID community awareness campaigns. Despite these efforts, longer and more frequent waves of COVID-19 have implicated, impacted Indonesia's TB program over the last two years. And while preliminary data shows that there will be a slight 6% increase in case notifications in 21, the country's recovery will take longer, requiring substantial resources and efforts. While these initiatives are helping countries recover lost ground in the global fight to end TB, as well as building countries' airborne infections, infection defense capacities to respond to future airborne pandemics, they are sadly not enough. We must now do all we can to stop the COVID-19 long-term impact on TB services around the world, and in particularly in countries with the highest TB burdens. This requires strong commitments, including investing in infrastructure and innovations to address unmet TB needs and simultaneously contribute to future pandemic preparedness. For example, while it is well known that finding missing TB cases is one, of, is one of the most cost-effective interventions to address TB, as it stands today, only 30% of the notified TB cases globally are diagnosed using rapid molecular techniques as recommended by the World Health Organization. The remaining two thirds are diagnosed via clinical and smear practices similar to 100 years ago, as health services often do not cover the cost of WHO recommended test. Almost 30% of findings per TB cases come from out-of-pocket costs. While HIV programs have been successful at driving down the out-of-pocket costs, people with TB and their families pay eight times more for diagnosis and treatment than people with HIV, hampering access to TB diagnosis and treatment and perpetuating poverty among the world's poorest and most marginalized populations. 
It will not be possible to end TB without innovative financing and other resources to address the significant funding gaps that exist within the high TB burden countries. The investment, however, will be worth it. As we have seen during the pandemic, when so many TB systems and staff were used to combat COVID-19, USAID's TB investments have been effective in building systems from community, primary to tertiary care, while curing people and saving lives. As we have learned over the past two years, we cannot continue business as usual in the way we fight TB. It is critical to innovate and adapt our programs to aggressively fight both TB, TB and COVID and prepare for future airborne threats. Thank you all for your focus on World TB Day and every day. Thank you very much, uh, Paul, uh, for your uh, strong uh, message and um, uh, outstanding, uh, really outstanding work. Probably I didn't uh, introduce the right way. Uh, USAID is not only big biggest bilateral donor, but a real driver and accelerator of the progress and provide which provides support uh, to the countries, of course, regions, and also uh, to, to the WHO and Global Tuberculosis Program. So thank you very much. And uh, thank you also for mentioning uh, that this important issue of, of out-of-pocket expenditures. This is also uh, the, the result of uh, these consistent financial gaps and chronic underfunding of TB programs. And even if we have much better tools to diagnose and treat TB due to these reasons uh, uh, people don't have access to them and we are continuing in the 21st century uh, the uh, clinically diagnosed a TB while we have uh, much better and effective tools and we are continuing uh, uh, treatment not always using the latest uh, the uh, the best treatment options so that's why uh, funding investments are absolutely essential and thank you very much for your true partnership and collaboration so Dear colleagues, we've covered already many aspects and uh, uh, trying to follow uh, the theme of the World TB Day uh, about the investments, the different kind of investments. And uh, of course, we should not neglect uh, investments in uh, TB research and innovations. Uh, we are still using more than 100 years old BCG vaccine, which is not uh, effective. And again, this is uh, uh, the, the, the result of uh, the chronic underfunding of TB research and innovations. And we can bring many other examples. But we have today with us a uh, uh, representative of uh, the organization, our uh, close partner, uh, with unique man mandate, uh, which is focusing on the uptake, fastest uptake of uh, the uh, research and innovation and introduction them into practice. Um, I would like uh, to greet Dr. Philippe Duneton, Executive Director of UNITAID, and uh, acknowledge the efforts uh, uh, spearheading efforts uh, indeed on TB research and innovations and ask what do you see as an important consideration to scale up investments in TB research, uh, leveraging lessons from the COVID uh, pandemic and how UNITAID is helping to close the gap? Philip? Yes, uh, thank you very much, Teresa, for your kind invitation and uh, Good afternoon, uh, good morning, good evening, excellencies and dear colleagues and partners. A lot has been said already, but um, I think that we need all to recognize for this TB day, the alarming situation with the, for the first time in many years, the increased number of cases. Of course, um, we know the situation. We have been also together with other colleagues and part of the Global Fund, at the forefront of the fight against COVID-19 pandemic, which is a, also an airborne uh, disease. And I'm afraid that uh, to say that there are commonalities in terms of how to fight the, the, the airborne diseases, because, well, you need testing. You need, uh, of course, uh, access to oxygen for severe cases. And uh, you need also a way to address, test, and treat with the right tools. 
So I think that's one thing it's quite important to recognize that for a long time in TB, we have been using um, old tools as just uh, uh, Dr. Teresa uh, has said. Um, we had uh, old vaccines, we, uh, we had old drugs for more than 40 years, we had only the drugs that were discovered in the uh, 50s and uh, we had bad um, uh, diagnostic. That's the situation that uh, as United, we tried to uh, change uh, with, of course, the support of WHO, but also uh, the support of our partners like the Global Fund and, and USAID. One thing to start with is to uh, recognize that uh, as United, we have put um, what a big effort in the clinical evidence, um, again, together with WHO, but uh, we have the biggest uh, clinical trial for MDRTB uh, over the world with uh, partners in health and, and uh, Médecins Sans Frontières. I think it's quite important that the, all the steps that, not specifically but for, for TB, but including TB, are uh, based on clinical evidence. Um, and we need also, um, also to think in the short and medium term of the opportunities that new tools can bring. Uh, Teresa, you mentioned the RNA platform. Um, and of course, um, we hope that through that kind of platform, we can find a way uh, to have a, a vaccines that works uh, against, um, against TB. By the way, I just want also to recognize that there, I've seen a lot of efforts in a research center in the south. Um, just want to um, just to mention that uh, I've seen a young uh, uh, PhD uh, students that try to redevelop the BCG vaccine with uh, CRISP technology. I was amazed to see the, the kind of work that uh, and the, the, the commitment and the, from him and the team. So it's too early to say that it will work, but I think that that kind of idea to say, okay, what kind of new tools we have and how we can change the reality of the response is absolutely key. And some of that and a lot of that can come also from the countries in the South. So I think it's quite important. The second point I want to make is how important it is to have the resource to do that. So I fully support what uh, Peter uh, said. I think that the reality is the, the situation of COVID-19, we know the situation, the situation of crisis and war in several places, including Ukraine, Syria, Libya, and uh, Yemen, is not an excuse not to do the work to address the uh, global health challenge, including TB. Uh, even it should be uh, even a, um, an incentive. In terms of innovation, um, I think um, it has been said, but I think that there are a lot of progress that are coming or we can build in, in terms of testing, which uh, is the first step of the response. Without testing, uh, we will not have an effective way to, uh, to treat the people. So again, we hope that the, the PCR uh, approach uh, can be expanded with uh, not only uh, more competition, but a decrease of price of the tools of at, at least alternative. And we are looking at that with other partners like FINE, but uh, we have also uh, an interest in lateral flow test that can be uh, for, in particular for the people living with HIV quite key in detecting uh, much faster the infection of uh, tuberculosis. The, the second example, for us, which is absolutely key. And again, we have been uh, quite uh, proactive in that with uh, certain countries, in particular in South part of Africa, including South Africa, but also with the support of WHO, is the EHP. So it's using rifapantin uh, in a way that, uh, in combination with ANH, that uh, can decrease the, 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 the incidence of TB thing is that the next step is already we have uh, support access for 3 million of people 
and of course transition with USAID and PEPFAR and, and the Global Fund. So I think it's part of the response we need. Uh, we don't have a vaccine, but we have a way to prevent infection. And I think that one of the next steps that uh, would be hopefully addressed is how to deal with the contact cases. Um, I think that there is initiative in India, but also for children. The, the last, the third example I want to draw is pediatric formulation. It has been mentioned by Teresa. I think it's quite important that to see the guidelines for prevention and treatment of TB among children and adolescents. We have been uh, supporting the development of the first pediatric formulation ever after 50 years of uh, adult formulation, but not turned into pediatric formulation. Now more than 100 countries in the world are using it. Um, again, I think that this job is not finished because we are also working with institute in the South with Oram Institute in Selembosch to uh, decrease the, 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 the load, uh, the, the pill burden for NDRTB among children. So again, um, it, uh, fights TB without the right tool will be ineffective. So we need to continue to invest in clinical evidence, new tools that are coming. And again, there are potential. But uh, also we need, uh, again, a fully funded response, but also a fully funded way to uh, have the product introduction and development right. Thank you for your attention this afternoon. Over. Thank you very much, uh, Philippe, uh, for your true partnership and uh, for the strategic and, in the same time, a very practical, impact-oriented approach. And you gave example of uh, our advantages uh, and huge step forward we managed to do uh, with the pediatric formulations and uh, development of the new guidelines for children and uh, adolescents. Uh, yes, we have uh, these opportunities and now uh, or they should be fully funded uh, to, to, to avoid any barriers in accessing them. And also another point you mentioned is that we are using old vaccines, old drugs. Sometimes TB is called old disease, but in fact, it's 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 young disease because uh, uh, it's adapting to the new conditions existing for centuries affecting young people and uh, uh, has a even threatening a profile with a drug resistant uh, TB renewed a renewed profile so that's why we need more energy and young people involvement with the new ideas innovative ideas and I know that Philip you and your team and uh, your board members will be uh, happy to support these innovations um, we we are talking a lot and trying to balance between our challenges and opportunities and definitely as our director general dr tedros is repeatedly saying that let's try to convert our challenges into the opportunities and we've managed to do some some important steps toward that uh, uh, vision and um, before introducing my uh, next speaker i must say that we are unanimous with our closest partners and um, aligned probably uh, now as never before due to uh, our difficulties, uh, uh, due to the um, uh, challenges, unusual way of working with COVID-19. We understood that only uh, being uh, aligned and joined uh, uh, with unanimous with with our messaging and requests, we can achieve some progress. Um, and I would like to thank for joining uh, Dr. Suvanan Sahu, Deputy uh, Executive Director of the Stop TB Partnership. And we know very well uh, that uh, uh, Luchika herself as uh, uh, Executive Director and all the team Sahu uh, been very vocal uh, uh, about our problems, what should be done, about deadly divide faced by TB compared to other threats for investments in TB response and research. And could you please, Sahu, share with us your perspectives on this? Um, there are also widening investments gap uh, according to the new Stop TB Global Plan, um, uh, given new tools and new guidelines, 
um, what do you see as an important actions to close these funding gaps? Sahu, please, floor is here. Thank you, Teresa, and uh, thanks to WHO for convening this meeting on World TB Day. Uh, honorable ministers, panelists, partners, participants. Let me start uh, by connecting to what Teresa said about deadly divides. Uh, there is a deadly divide between our commitments and the reality. And if you look at the commitments in the UN high-level meeting on TB in 2018, including the promise of mobilization of resources and the reality now, four years later, it is very clear. This was very well highlighted by the TB affected communities report, which was actually designated, uh, titled as deadly divide. There is also a deadly divide between how the world reacts to TB and for example, COVID. So let me take the example of COVID. We all witnessed what happened with the COVID pandemic. The world was so unprepared at the beginning of the pandemic, but how resources and expertise were mobilized to develop diagnostics and vaccines from scratch and how testing and tracing happened at scale. Take the example of vaccines. About 100 billion US dollar, billion with a B billion, US dollar was mobilized for research and development of COVID vaccine vaccines in just one, just over a year time. Compare this with TB. In 2020, the funding available for TB vaccine research and development was only 117 million, million with the M there. Huge divide there, right? Front loading of financing and faster research techniques enabled COVID vaccines to be researched and put into people's arm in less than one year. Compare this with TB. There are multiple candidates, TB, candidate TB vaccines under research for years, some of them more than a decade, and struggling on a slow pathway interrupted by resource constraints. Let me take just one more example. For COVID, we saw testing, testing go to unprecedented scale with modern tools. Compare this with TB. Screening and testing in TB is so limited that 4 million people with TB each year are not diagnosed or notified. And among those who are diagnosed for TB, only one in three actually get a modern WHO recommended molecular test. Lack of financial resources is a major reason for this situation. Now, we all saw that TB programs in many high TB burden countries were launch pad for initial COVID responses. They were launch pads. A natural choice because TB programs had the expertise and the infrastructure to deal with respiratory infections. But what happened later is well documented. The repurposing of uh, TB programs led to a setback in, in the TB responses. Now, if you ask the question, why did this happen? The answer is very simple, because TB programs had been chronically underfunded and did not have the surge capacity, the surge capacity to deal with two diseases. First of all, to deal with TB during the lockdowns, and then to also deal with a new infection like COVID. So now, in the context of pandemic preparedness, pandemic preparedness and response, we need to ensure that TB programs are well resourced with enough surge capacity to help in the response to future pandemics, especially if the pandemics are respiratory airborne in nature. Now, um, I was very happy to uh, listen to the Honorable Minister of Indonesia on his plans for optimizing the COVID-19 resources for TB. We look forward to, the, to his leadership during the G20 Indonesia presidency in 2022. And as Teresa mentioned, there is a G20 side event at the end of this month 
So we look forward to that opportunity and the leadership of Indonesia in this. There are, uh, although COVID pandemic had, had a huge setback on TB, there are important lessons that we must learn from the COVID pandemic on how to mobilize resources, testing, tracing done at scale, digital tool use, and airborne infection prevention and control. Just a few examples. There could be many others as well. These learnings have the potential to boost the TB response and help us proceed faster towards ending TB. Now, let me talk a little bit about uh, resources needed to end TB. We all are aware that the UNHLM commitment in 2018 was to mobilize 13 billion US dollar per year for TB care and prevention, and an additional 2 billion per year for research and development, total 15 billion, 15 billion per year. This was for the period 2018 to 2022. Now, if you look at how much is available, less than half of that funding is available. The gap is currently 9 billion US dollar. If you compare it with the 15 billion US dollar need per year, which was committed in the UNHLM political declaration. Now we are going ahead from 2022, moving towards 2030. So, the, so going forward for the next eight years, between 2023 and 2030, the Stop TB partnership is currently developing the new global plan. Uh, it is a very inclusive process. Uh, I think uh, some of you may have been already involved in some of the consultations that happened. Now, uh, what the global plan shows is that despite the setback due to the COVID pandemic, we can still end TB, but increased resources will be needed, of course. The resource needs have been estimated. They increased to 19.6 billion per annum, 19.6 billion per year for TB care and prevention, and an additional 4 billion, 4 billion US dollar per annum for research and development. It is also estimated that an additional 53 billion US dollar will be needed to vaccinate people because we, we all expect a new vaccine to come after 2025. So uh, to vaccinate people, uh, uh, there will be a resource need there. So a total of 242 billion US dollar made available in this next eight years can NTB. This means the current available funding for TB care and prevention, as well as research and development, need to be quadrupled, quadrupled four times. On the World TB Day, uh, we call on uh, world leaders to invest on ending TB and saving lives. This is an opportunity to save as much as 4,000 lives a day difficult to find smarter investments than this. We call on all partners to work towards increasing the resources available for TB. I must, say by, uh, by, I must end by saying that uh, not making the funds available will be more expensive. TB, an airborne disease with drug resistant variants, can go out of control and pose a global health security risk and addressing TB in future will become more and more expensive. So thank you for the opportunity. I hand over back to Teresa. So thank you. Thank you very much, Asako, for your very important highlights, uh, accompanied by a clear logic uh, algorithms and uh, numbers. Uh, I think that it helps a lot to understand the current situation. And we are uh, saying frequently that we should learn lessons from uh, the, the different situations, including from COVID-19. But in fact, we are not learning. Uh, so uh, we, uh, we are explaining why we should invest uh, minimum required resources, which in compare, we, you give the comparison that 100 billion uh, for, for the development of COVID vaccines had been collected very fast without any complaints or that it's too difficult. But we are asking for TB research uh, according to our commitments. 
uh, one additional billion and it's not possible and your final conclusion is um, uh, absolutely uh, essential that if we can't find today one dollar to invest in TB. Tomorrow we have to find ten dollars. The mathematics is quite clear, simple, and uh, uh, I think that we should uh, finally take uh, all these messages into consideration and uh, prioritize our investments and uh, in TB programs. Thank you, Saho. Uh, dear colleagues, we are moving. Um, towards the end of this important talk show, but we have a, a very uh, important uh, speaker with us, uh, Mr. Bertrand Kampor, a representative of WHO Civil Society Task Force on TB. And um, we thank Bertrand for joining despite a very sad time uh, for him. Uh, we offer you our deepest uh, condolences and uh, Thank you. You are remaining with us in the bright and in the green, green moments of, of your life. And please keep strong. And once again, thank you for joining uh, this panel. Um, please share with us perspectives of, of the civil society, civil society uh, task force, uh, uh, what actions uh, will be needed to help uh, uh, to uh, uh, raise more funding investments to accelerate TB response and save lives? Bertrand. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Teresa. Uh, distinguished guests, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, TB patient, TB advocate, and TB civil society. And again, uh, Teresa, uh, thank you for the word because in reality, I lost my my father last Saturday here in Cameroon. And then, uh, so when we suffer such a great, a great uh, loss, we, so we can understand the indignation of always wanting to consider human life as statistic case while behind their uh, human being with different uh, family and social connection. So in our context today, we can also ask the question of why uh, more than 100 years later, we are still running for, for example, a simple vaccine uh, for the TB response who can save additional life. So today, from the perspective of the civil society task force, uh, there are six points I would like to highlight as important civil society led Bertrand, uh, can you can you can help uh, drive increased investments to accelerate the TB response and advocacy? Uh, yes, please. Uh, uh, yes, please go ahead. Uh, though you've been interrupted for a moment, but now it's okay. Please. Okay, thank you. I'm saying that from the perspective of the civil society task force, I would like to uh, highlight six. A different point. The first point is in terms of advocacy, advocacy to ensure um, domestic, political, and financial commitment from respective government. Uh, also, uh, advocacy for resource mobilization. Uh, but in terms of advocacy for resource mobilization, we realize uh, the, to we realize that the TB affected community, for example. Uh, we fail our recent advocacy campaign to increase the global fund disease split by 33% for TB allocation. Uh, so the question can be why? Why? Because this is a tradition. The tradition is that TB is underfunded. The tradition is that on our mind, we believe that we are not needing additional resources to overcome TB. Uh, we have good plan. We have the NTB strategy. We have the global plan. We have the global fund. We have the new global fund strategic plan, but we are lacking money. We are lacking money to support our plan. So that's why, as uh, Stop TB Dr. Saur said, that we believe that uh, from from the end of this year, maybe we can also close the gap in terms of billion who are needed to to move to our NTB strategy. So the second point in terms of our perspective of civil society task force is the monitoring progress of the MAF-TB process through meaningful engagement 
with affected community and civil society. Just to remind that uh, the civil society task force participate on the, the, the document to finalize the WHO checklist for the MAF. Um, but also, uh, we, today, uh, GTB, the Global TV Program, issued a consultation on the guidance on country adaptation and implementation of the multi-sectoral accountability framework to accelerate the progress to NTB by 2030. And again, uh, the civil society task force will be really fully engaged. And one of our members was part of this document, who, who, uh, for, for, was the part of this gui guidance, who the consultation was open today. The third, the third point is in terms of innovation, including accelerated use of digital technology and civil society engagement in integrated COVID-19 and TB response. Uh, today, in terms of innovation, digital technology innovation, today 20 countries use what impacts community-led monitoring. This is the digital technology, a digital solution, a digital application to empower people affected by TB to claim their right, their right, access health and support service and reports and eliminate TB stigma and discrimination through an innovative mobile application and system, one impact community-led monitoring, encourage and facilitate the participation of people affected by TB in all aspects of TB programming and activate a human right-based TB people-centered response. So the point number four is in terms of community engagement, capacity building of civil society and affected community to achieve their meaningful engagement in all the journey of the TB response, including high level strategic governance and leadership, planning, implementation, and joint programming, monitoring, and periodic review. And so civil society task force greatly appreciate WHO effort for strong and meaningful collaboration with civil society. In fact, the WHO Civil Society Task Force is fully engaged in major WHO GTB effort, for example, input to WHO guidance document related to TB and COVID-19, UN SD progress report, GTG start, NTB webinar, consultation with WHO regional office, and strong engagement and dialogue with WHO GG resulting in joint statement. Point number five is in terms of promoting human rights and combat stigma and discrimination. The UNHLM on TB saw country commit to an equitable and human rights based TB on. Moreover, according to Article 1 of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, all human beings are born equal in dignity and rights. But are they reality? For example, the TB language are still the most stigmatized among the global health. We are still the case, not human being. This needs to change. Appropriate guide exists are now available today as the declaration of the right of people affected by TB. The TB the activate a human rights TB response, a guide produced by DCTA, the Global Coalition of Eight Activists, and the up upcoming updates, Stop TV, every, every word counts. And point number six is in terms of increased sustainable TB financing for civil society and community. Actually, there is an existing, existing leading grant mechanism for a grassroots TB affected community organization conceptualized and coordinated by Stop TB Challenge Facility for Civil Society. It's also support affected TB community and civil society working at national, regional, and global level to transform and focus the TB response on community-led engagement, human rights, and gender equality to NTB. So we need more donors to fund this fund. Actually, there is strong support from USID and the Global Fund, but we still need more donors because grassroots organizations involved in the TB response face huge challenge to assess resources. And the last point who is cross-cutting would like to draw the attention on the upcoming UN high-level meeting on TB 2023 and encourage urgent action to ensure country engagement at highest level 
through meaningful collaboration with national affected community and civil society to ensure strong CD response in the SDG area. Thank you so much, uh, Teresa. Over. So, thank you very much, uh, Bertrand. And uh, I would like also to uh, acknowledge a great work and contribution into WHO's work of the WHO Civil Society Task Force. Uh, as you all know, a few years ago, we uh, uh, revamped and uh, uh, reviewed all the pr principles of collaboration. And now we are extremely pleased to see meaningful engagement of our uh, colleagues, friends in all key activities uh, of the global tuberculosis program and engagement not only at the global but also regional and country level and Bertrand, uh, special kudos to you as a champion uh, and uh, a driver of the uh, agenda for multi-sectoral um, engagement and accountability. So colleagues, uh, before we go to the interactive Q&A uh, session, uh, I would like um, to play a short video uh, on impact of small investments of care and support uh, that can have big impact in terms of lives saved. The doctor said that there's no need to worry because tuberculosis is treatable and curable. I just need to take my medicines and eat well. But tuberculosis makes me feel lost and alone. I miss my friend so much. Serioso Oh no, Nico. Nico. Oh, Nico. Am I strong enough to overcome this? <coughs> but I was never alone in my journey. I was so afraid I would lose my friends. My love. But I was wrong. They invested their love, care, and support for me. I was so happy to hear that I was free of tuberculosis. The doctor and the health workers helped me live. The medicines and treatment saved me. But most importantly, the hope and love my family and friends gave me helped me beat tuberculosis. My experience has inspired me. I want to invest in ending CB by supporting others in their journey of healing. Dear friends, so thank you very much uh, for staying uh, with us. Uh, it was excellent um, discussion, uh, very constructive uh, with uh, clear vision and proposals. And I hope that we will continue 
with that vision and with the same passion move uh, forward and to do our best to save millions uh, of lives and to stop suffering of people with tuberculosis. I now turn to Monica Diaz from WHO Global TB, TB Program uh, to facilitate the interactive uh, Q&A session. Thank you so much, Teresa. Um, and thanks to um, all of the participants who've uh, joined us today um, and who've posted their questions. We've received a lot of interest. We'd like to take the opportunity uh, to have just maybe two questions that we'd like to spotlight where there have been plenty of questions on. Um, the first question is um, on, um, of course, what's deeply concerning all of us uh, about the situation and crisis um, in Ukraine. Um, so the question from uh, Alphonse Chitral and others basically is around um, about Ukraine and um, what can be done uh, to address the situation, given that there is a high burden of drug-resistant TB, what steps can be taken? And also, very concrete ask from Chitral about, is there a financing mechanism available to help? Um, does WHO have this? Um, so I'll first start with Dr. Teresa Kasaeva. We'll go then to our regional office and then to the panelists. So first, over to you, Teresa. Uh, yes, uh, so indeed, it's um, it's very important uh, uh, questions, and your concerns are absolutely reasonable. Now, we as WHO following uh, our mandate and trying to address uh, as soon as possible all the needs of people, uh, of course, uh, health-related issues, uh, and our focus uh, today is on people people with uh, tuberculosis. We are working across all three levels, of course, at the first front country, WHO country office, regional office, we uh, at the, the global level also on daily basis uh, interacting with them and uh, uh, working closely with the Ministry of Health representative with the National Tuberculosis Program of Ukraine with the uh, 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 representative of different NGOs and the partners organization. And of course, all together, all uh, the speakers from, especially from the second panel, uh, are working closely, Global Fund, the UNITAID, Stop TB Partnership, and its Global Drug Facility. Uh, so U USAID is also closely involved uh, and providing all, um, uh, all uh, possible support. Given the rapidly changing security situation, uh, procurement and uh, supply of TB medicines uh, is of our concern and is closely monitored and uh, prioritized by the national TB programs. Uh, likely, just before the, this uh, this conflict, all uh, the necessary um, uh, the the procurement activities uh, and uh, were provided, and uh, there are stocks. Uh, according, I, I hope that colleagues from the regional office will give more details. Uh, uh, according to my understanding, uh, 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 there there are stocks available. Of course, uh, the uh, continuation of uh, essential services. Uh, uh, continuation and non-interruption of treatment. Uh, it's absolutely the, the, the priority. Uh, the colleagues from the regional and country office are working closely with the neighboring country because um, according to the latest information, more than 3.5 million uh, refugees are crossing the borders and uh, um, around 50% of them are children. Mm. Of course, all their needs should be uh, should be uh, addressed. Uh, um, also, uh, as I told, uh, we has published an appeal. WHO has published an appeal outlining the health needs and related costs uh, arising from the uh, crisis, uh, including for diseases such such as TB. And the emergency appeal, um, powered by WHO Foundation, and raises. Uh, funds uh, for WHO's frontline, and we've heard today from the Global Fund that they rapidly responded and released funds uh, uh, for for the needs of uh, people with uh, TB, HIV, and other communicable diseases. Uh, of course, psychosocial support uh, is needed, and uh, our colleagues from other departments, uh, uh, mental health, um, uh, are working. Uh, 
uh, closely. So massive needs uh, and uh, a lot of things. It's a real humanitarian uh, crisis. So and uh, uh, all the support from different sides will be uh, will be appreciated and much needed. So. Thank you very much, Teresa. Um, we'd now like to turn uh, to Dr. Askar Yedilbayev, who's uh, joining us um, from the WHO Regional Office um, for Europe. He is the TB Regional Advisor. Um, Askar, uh, grateful if you could uh, provide a quick update of um, what's, uh, what support is being provided um, on the ground and key opportunities um, in this situation. Over to you. Uh, thank you very much, Monica. And as uh, following the words of uh, Dr. Teresa Kasayeva, indeed, the WHO at all three levels of organization, the headquarters, the regional office, and especially WHO country office, are trying to uh, support uh, um, the, in, uh, the continuity of treatment uh, and care uh, for those people affected by tuberculosis and drug-resistant tuberculosis in Ukraine and uh, those people who escaped, uh, who had to escape from the, uh, from the war to the neighboring countries. So we are deeply concerned of the uh, escalating uh, crisis and uh, are trying to collaborate and coordinate all of our efforts with multiple partners and donor organizations uh, and uh, of course, in collaboration and partnership with the uh, with the ministries of health of the of the uh, European countries. So, as you know, the undiagnosed and untreated tuberculosis, especially multidrug resistant tuberculosis, can lead to the very serious public health consequences, and uh, such is the uh, much lower chances to be cured uh, of from tuberculosis and increased death. So, and uh, with that, uh, for, to address those uh, continuity of care and treatment uh, of patients inside Ukraine, uh, the, um, through the partnership uh, with the um, uh, organizations, the Global Fund uh, has allocated the emergency funding to ensure the availability of me medicines, like emergency uh, stock of medicines for uh, mostly for treatment of multidrug resistant tuberculosis, and uh, they have been uh, they will be uh, uh, procured through the uh, Stop TB Partnership Global uh, Drug Facility. So the immediate needs, whenever it will be needed, uh, such as destroyed facilities and infrastructure of tuberculosis services inside Ukraine. Uh, and they will be uh, fulfilled through this emergency funding. And it is expected that UNICEF will facilitate the process of this, uh, of this, uh, of this mechanism uh, for, patients, for people affected by TB inside Ukraine. And WHO has been supporting and a part of the group for coordination. But at the same time, and as it has been said by uh, Dr. Teresa Kasayeva, daily the number of people who are escaping uh, Ukraine from the war is uh, exceeding three and a half million people. So, uh, and 50% of these people of, uh, are children. So most of the men uh, are staying in Ukraine because there are age restrictions, but taking into account and looking at the patient profile of uh, people with TB and especially of MDR-TB, the majority of patients are men. So, but nevertheless, it does not uh, undermine uh, the fact that the neighboring countries might face uh, the influx of uh, refugees who, are, who would need continuation of treatment. And this is the one of the major concern of the WHO at all three levels. And we're working closely with the ministries of health of the, of the countries of the WHO European region, and especially with uh, our partners and colleagues. So that's, uh, there are several uh, steps that we are trying to address. Uh, first is the short, mid-term and the long-term. The short-term is to ensure the availability of medicines, same medicines that has been, you have been used for people affected by M uh, TB and MDR-TB uh, and would require continuity of treatment. Uh, uh, before the war, um, and people uh, to tuberculosis patients have been provided with a one or two month supply for self-administration because it was really hard to, uh, um, 
to, to ensure the uh, observation of treatment. And uh, those people who are as, um, going outside of Ukraine are being provided with this one or two month supply. So that is why it's in our urgent need to ensure that the sufficient uh, supply of medicines is being ensured for these the people to, to continue the, tr the treatment. We have very good examples. And the neighboring countries such as uh, Republic of Moldova are showing uh, uh, great support for those people in need. So, uh, and right now we also, the WHO uh, Euro uh, is working on establishing the emergency uh, stock of those medicines used for treatment of multidrug resistant TB uh, and some of the pediatric uh, formulations for people outside of Ukraine. As a long term, we are asking the member states to uh, ensure support from their national resources and also uh, to ensure that the access to the healthcare is equal as the same as for the uh, as for their own nationals so it's a deep concern from our side and we together with partners are doing our best to to address these issues and challenges thank you Thank you so much, Askar, for that comprehensive overview. Indeed, a lot's being done on the ground and um, much more, of course, needs to be done. And all um, support is appreciated from partners, civil society and others in this effort. Let me now uh, turn to our panelists. Um, we have um, yeah, uh, Sahu from Stop TB or Eliud, um, who's here in place um, of Global Fund or Bertrand. Uh, would you like to add? Go ahead, Eliud. Can you please unmute? Eliud, we can't hear you. Could you please unmute? Unfortunately, we can't hear you, Eliud. Maybe we can uh, come back to you in a bit. Let's try one more time. Do you want to un uh, unmute? Okay, um, Sahu, would you like to add? Eliud, maybe you could say a few words, no? Okay, so then maybe we can come back uh, to this question. There's one more question from Selvarajan um, from Tamil Nadu, India. Um, who's asking about uh, the need for vaccines, that um, the vaccines for COVID-19 came about pretty rapidly in two years, but um, it's way overdue and pending for years, as, uh, as uh, many of the panelists and Teresa have already mentioned about TB vaccines, it's long overdue. Um, so what steps can be taken to address this? So I'll start again with WHO and then go to the panelists. Over to you, Teresa. Uh, okay, try to be brief. Uh, uh, we have uh, uh, around nine vaccines in our pipeline, at the advanced stages of the clinical trials, and uh, at least one vaccine, very promising, M72, at, uh, uh, for phase 2B trials completed. And uh, now uh, we've tried to um, bring uh, uh, this current status of the vaccine development on table already two, two years ago uh, to engage all the stakeholders, donors uh, uh, and uh, member states uh, in the development of the vaccines. Unfortunately, we didn't manage to receive the same level of interest and attention as we could see from COVID-19. But now, again, learning lessons, we will continue our advocacy. And uh, furthermore, now we have interest from the companies and platforms using mRNA, uh, and the mRNA platforms for the, uh, they are interested to also to be engaged in the development of TB vaccines. So trying to capitalize on this momentum, we've finalized from our side a full value assessment for the uh, TB vaccines development, uh, providing all the technical uh, work support together with our, our colleagues from the vaccines department. So we hope uh, to galvanize attention and put spotlight on this topic 
topic this year as much as possible. And of course, your engagement of all of your, your advocacy for financing, first of all, will be uh, very much needed. It's possible now to have vaccines for TB before 2025 and no excuses could be accepted. Thank you so much, Teresa. We'd now like to quickly um, see if any of the other panelists would like to add. You could unmute yourself. Okay, in that case, um, we will turn back uh, to Dr. Teresa Kasaiva um, for, the, for the last step. Thank you everyone for your questions and um, for, to, uh, for all the responses. Thank you. Uh, yes, uh, and colleagues, uh, uh, please would like to, to uh, let you know that you still have opportunity to, to uh, send your questions through our NTB Forum interactive platform and anytime uh, we are open for, for, for your suggestions, uh, for your questions, uh, please don't hesitate, uh, uh, stay in touch with us. Uh, I'm now pleased to invite uh, Dr. Ren Mingui, WHO Assistant Director General uh, for Universal Health Coverage, Communicable and Non-Communicable Diseases. He heads the division uh, the Global TB program is housed under, and uh, he is a, a true unwavering uh, champion uh, in ending TB efforts for many years. And uh, Dr. Ren, we, we are pleased to have you today with us and would appreciate uh, your uh, message and closing of this important event. Thank you, <coughs> Teresa. Your Excellencies, uh, distinguished participants, dear colleagues, partners, and dear friends, today's discussions and dialogue has been very inspiring and productive and will help us and also the world get back on track to NTB in the midst of the COVID-19 pandemic and also ongoing humanitarian crisis sparked by the conflicts in the Europeans, African, and Middle East and elsewhere across the world. As Dr. Tedros said in his opening remarks, TB remains one of the leading infectious causes of death in the world, claiming more than 1.5 million lives each year and causing untold suffering to those affected and their families. With COVID-19, this situation has worsened. As we have heard from the countries, the partners and civil society, and also the questions we received uh, in during this conversation. The investment gaps are one of the main barriers to scaling up the TB response and reaching the target. We need to address these challenges and redouble our efforts to, incur, to ensure all people with TB can access quality of prevention and care in line with WHO's drive towards achieving universal health coverage particularly the most vulnerable populations, such as those affected by the current conflicts. As I close, I would like to remind you of WHO's five top calls for action this year. First, we would like to call for an increase in domestic and international investment to close the major financing gaps for preventing diagnosis and treating TB. Second, Financing for TB research must more than double to drive the discovery of new tools, including vaccines, and to scale up life-saving innovations. Third, we need to invest in sustaining essential TB services during COVID-19 pandemic and ongoing conflicts to ensure that the gain made in the fight against TB are not reserved. I would like to draw your attention to the WHO emergency appeal for COVID uh, for the Ukraine and the neighboring countries, which outlines health needs and also related costs across uh, arising from the crisis, including for TB, such as including disease such as TB. Fourth, we need to invest in accelerating the uptakes of new WHO guidelines and tools discussed earlier that can significantly improve access, quality of care, and outcome for those affected. Fourth, we need all sectors and all stakeholders engaged and accountable, from the governments 
to partners, to health workers, communities, and those affected. At WHO, we are committed to leading the to NTB response and keeping the promise made to the millions of affected by TB each year, despite any hardships, challenges, or crisis that comes to our way. We call on you to join us by contributing in and anywhere you can. Everyone has a role to play in ending TB, including individuals, communities, civil society, businesses, and governments. I would like to thank our intimate speakers and panelists and you, our audience, for joining us and keeping this lines on ending TB. Together, we can end TB and save lines. With that, thank you very much from WHO. Back to you, Teresa. So, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Uh, Ren, for your strong support and leadership. Yes, indeed. This is the end of our today's uh, today's event, but it's the beginning of uh, the, our big uh, advocacy campaign uh, for the investments uh, in ending TB and saving lives. Thank you very much for your attention.